Well, good afternoon, everyone. Glad you're here. So nice to see all of you in person. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce your two first presenters today, uh, Charles Clark and Fred Farrell. Charles is affectionately known to us as Clay. He is a partner with the uh, law firm of Clark, May, and Price. He obtained his BS degree from the University of North Alabama in 1980, and his law degree from Cumberland School of Law here at Sanford University in 1983. He's qualified to handle general liability litigation, products liability, toxic exposure, industrial accident, workers' compensation, employment litigation, and retaliatory discharge. Um, he has been listed as, or among the best lawyers in America. And we're always happy to have Clay present to, to our group. Uh, let me introduce Fred Farrell. He's a shareholder in the Huntsville Law, Law Office of Wilmer and Lee. Uh, he is a frequent lec lecturer here at workers' comp seminars. He uh, <clears throat> obtained his law degree from the University of Alabama, where he won the moot court competition and was selected as outstanding oral advocate. He is also selected to the best lawyers in America so please give it up for Just Ask Clay and Fred. Henry, thank you very much. Not nearly that qualified, I promise. Um, okay, so um, this is an opportunity for you to ask Clay and Fred, not that you're gonna be able to get a question in uh, edgewise. So we're just gonna start talking and uh, we'll see where things go. And if you have a question, please, please ask. Fred, do you want to start? Do you want me to start? Take off. Okay. So one of the things I was thinking, you know, all the way over here is that, is that, you know, doing this job, and I'm talking about managing claims, doing this job effectively really requires a lot of different talents, not the least of which is understanding human behavior. I mean, think about it. Think of, I mean, you know, we, I mean, this is a nuanced business and we, and if you understand human behavior, you can, you can really get an edge on about how you ought to manage claims. For example, so if you have an injured worker who is progressing along and they reach maximum medical improvement, okay, you know that that is a change in the claim, okay? So does the injured worker. And the injured worker is, by virtue of the fact that they're now as good as they're going to get, according to the doctor, and they've most certainly been told that by the doctor, not by the nurse case manager, not by you, okay? So they know that the claim is postured for change at that juncture. So that is a good opportunity for us to try to close the claim, okay, by settlement. That's, that is the best first opportunity that you have. They may or may not be represented by counsel. Um, there's a greater chance that if they're not gonna be represented by counsel, it's gonna be during that very first phase, but they, they are expecting a change. That's when, we're, that's when it's a good opportunity for us to try to get that case settled, okay? And it's an, it's an, and because up to that point, what you've been doing is that you have been having some dialogue with the injured worker, which has the side benefit of what? Establishing some trust by which you, which you can exploit. And when I say exploit, I'm using that phrase in sort of a, in, in a very pragmatic way. If they, if the injured worker is trusting what you're, what you're telling him, then the injured worker may very well likely trust the offer that's being made and you need to make a fair offer, okay? If their impairment rating is 15%, whatever, don't offer them 15, okay? It's a reference point for settlement, but you can offer them something more and tell them what you're doing, okay? That is a great opportunity to end the claim right there and keep it from going to, to, to people like me and Fred, right, Fred? Well, this, let me just begin by saying, this, you're talking about human behavior. This is great. I understand there are a thousand of you out there in TV land. Am I on that? Okay, good. So I just want to say hello to all of you. Hey, mom, how are you? Okay. Uh, Did you say TV you land? Know, this is great. TV that land. That's oh, a yeah. hyper modern well, Computer term, land. Right? We're showing our age. You know, speaking of age, uh, 
Okay, so the, yeah, I, I'm going to the Alabama LSU game Saturday night, ready to go. And I love football, as I've told y'all before. Uh, last year, we, you know, we were coming out of COVID. We couldn't talk to him by my, I, I married an Auburn girl. So we're all, we can't watch the Alabama-Auburn game together. But, uh, you know, we were watching the Alabama-Auburn game together last year, a mistake. And so, uh, you know, I get all giddy when Alabama was winning. And she looked over at me and she said, Fred, I want to know, what, who do you, what do you love more, me or football? And I thought for a second, I went, you talking college or pro? She said, you don't even know how long we've been married. I said, sure, I do, 38 seasons. <laughs> I remember when she was at Auburn and we were dating and I called one day and I said, hey, will you marry me? She picked the phone and she goes, yes, yes, who is this? <laughs> I asked people today for the best jokes they could come up with. And uh, one guy came up to me and he, he said, what do you call a camel with three humps? I said, I have no idea, pregnant. <laughs> That's the best I could come up with. Okay, <laughs> I got good news for you. We're going to run this ship on time. Clay and I, you know, we, one thing we do, we feel like you never get invited back if you go even two seconds over. So if we're midstream or whatever, we will quit. So you don't worry, all you people out there in computer land, we will quit on time. All right, Clay, I got one for you. All right, the first question. I'm going to, you know, we may not even be on the same topics today, but don't worry about that. We know where we are. Uh, my first question is, you know, Vince Lombardi used to tell the Green Bay Packers, at the beginning of every year. Gentlemen, this is a football. It's a simple game. And it seems to me that one of the things I've noticed is that we forget that sometimes. This is not nuclear physics. We're not inventing the atomic weapon here. This is work comp in Alabama. But the question we seem to miss sometimes is we get a claim and we start processing it. Nobody actually says, did an accident occur in the course of employment? And so the biggest mistake I always, and I, I want to say there was two or three mistakes I'm seeing out there. One is you think because they got hurt on the job, it is owed. That is not necessarily true. All right. The statute says it has to be in the course of and arise out of. Case I had for one of y'all in this room, the doctor treats the patient. The doctor says they fell at work. This is definitely work related with a broken hip. Okay. Okay. Well, you know what? It was an unexplained fall. That is uh, something that happened in the course of employment, but didn't arise out of employment. And the, yet the claim was paid until we got it. And they said, well, the doctor says it's related. Okay, good news for you doctors out there. You're not lawyers. Good news for the lawyers. We're not doctors. It was related to the fall, but that does not mean it was owed under workers' compensation. So when you get a claim in, the first football that you should get handed is, is this even a job injury? Does this have anything to do with work? And just because it happened at work doesn't mean it did. Clay. Well, that's true. I mean, it's, you know, this is, and, and the Alabama Court of Civil Appeals have been fairly uniform in, in this area, okay? So if there is not an employment connection, it doesn't make it, it's not compensable, even though it may have happened at work. If somebody has an idiopathic fall at work, that doesn't make it compensable automatically. I mean, if even if they fell and hit a, hit a you know, a, a, a chair or a desk on the way down, okay, they're going to hit something. I mean, if they fell on a moving machinery, well, that's going to be, that's going to be work related because that's, there's an employment connection with the injury under those circumstances. So, I mean, that is the first thing that we need to be, we need to be looking at. All right. I want to go back to understanding human behavior because I'm afraid I'll forget about it if I don't do it immediately and I'm easily distracted. So um, mediation is another area where we, where we're, we're bringing our knowledge of human behavior and the way we expect people to act to bear, okay? Why do we mediate cases in the first place, okay? As opposed to just direct negotiations. Because if you mediate the case, you're bringing additional dynamics to play that can assist the case getting settled, all right? Number one, you are bringing the sense of urgency, okay? This mediation has been set for six weeks. You have one opportunity to get this case settled. This is your best opportunity to settle the case. It puts pressure on the claimant to sort of come to grips with the claim at that point to sort of understand where his, where his personal, his or her personal trajectory is and whether it makes sense to settle the case. And usually they have that sense of urgency and that's something that we can make work for us, okay? We can also use the mediator as a vehicle for information that we want to get directly to the claimant and not necessarily have it filtered by the lawyer, okay? 
Not necessarily, okay? And sometimes, sometimes mediations fail, okay? That's not the end of the world. That's not the end of the world. Now, I am a firm believer that you come to mediation with, with some authority based on an appropriate evaluation and we can come prepared to settle the case because it's, it's just a matter of good faith and good form and it's what we should be doing, okay? And, it's, and it also conveys a sense of credibility. But if a case doesn't settle at mediation, then suspend the mediation, suspend it. It's not the end of the world. And if the parties are apart by a, by a reasonable sum of money, just a, do you know what happens? Do you know a strategy that works every single time? You let a few days go by and you come back and you say, why don't we split the difference? It has worked every single time I've tried to use it. Fred, we've no, used that before, right? In, in cases you've mediated. We have, I agree. I'm back on my track. Is it a football? <laughs> All right. You stick with the human behavior, I'll stick with the football. Here's what we do. All right. Here's another one that I'm seeing a classic mistake. And unfortunately, I've been involved in some mass shootings in some cases, in some cop cases. Some many have been in the news. You've seen some of them. But several years ago, I was involved with a case where two guys got into it at Roos Chris here in Birmingham. And they tried to file a comp claim. One of them's hurt, and one of them threw hot water on the other one. Okay. Well, he, why, you know, I'm like, that looks just like classic, classic, uh, I, I, a personal thing. Well, the guy who got hurt says, no, we were fighting over the arrangement of the shrimp on, on the shrimp bar. You know, that happens. We see that occasionally. And uh, people don't like the looks of it. And so they said they were fighting over it. Well, we denied the claim. Juster, by the way, got sued for outrage, got, got rid of that on summary judgment, uh, but denied the claim because what we found out was that what they were really fighting over was the chef. They both liked the same person. And this was a romantic deal. All right, now that does not arise out of employment. It happened at work. It's a reported case called Beverly versus Roos Chris now in the state of Alabama. Does, it does not arise out of employment that's the football, if it is related to personal things and not to work, similar to the idiopathic fall that I talked about earlier. And one other one I mentioned, Clay, and uh, as, we, as we go in our different al alternate universes here, that one of the things, too, is also the case of the traveling employee. And I tell you, this is going to be an interesting year. We had a case, bad facts make bad law. They, all just, they told us that in law school, and it's true. So you got to be careful. You got to pick the ones you really want to go to court with. But it was a horrible tragedy where a woman was killed and, and we, you know, but we didn't know if we owed it or not. She'd been an employee for 20 something years. She went on the wrong side, or somebody went on the wrong side of the road and killed her. Claim was denied. Ultimately, the Alabama appellate court said it was owed because she was going to work at home and she was taking her equipment with her and they allowed her to work from home. All right. Now, the thing that's going to get interesting, and I think the challenge for us in when we're going, is this owed? A lot of us are working from home right now. What if you are at home right now watching this Zoom conference? Watch us get like 25 claims for this after I mention it. <laughs> what if you fall over your cord and you break your hip because you were trying to watch this conference, but you're at home, but you're at work? Is that going to be covered? And I think we're going to see more of, old, more of this with all this COVID stuff, although it may be gone. I think it's gone. It might be gone. Clay. All right, I agree with that. You know, one of the things I'm seeing a lot and, and I, this is something I've not really expected, but I'm seeing this in cases recently. And we've got, we've got probably three or four in our office right now where, where the claimant for reasons that are not clear goes off and does their own medical treatment. Okay. So what does that do to us? I mean, we, we went to a hearing recently where plaintiff counsel says, I routinely tell my clients that if they feel like they need surgery, go, go to find a doctor and go get it done. Well, that's just, that's just not, that is, that is, that is, that may relieve us of legal liability. Okay. And I don't know what is going on with, with the plaintiff's bar, whether or not this is a new thing or not. Now they communicate a lot more effectively than we do. And they're plotting against us all the time. If you have any difficulty sleeping, but what we need to, to do is, is, is to, is to develop a law in this, in this respect for our side, the law is already pretty good. Okay, well, there's all these cases out there that stand for the proposition that look, if you go out and get an, an unauthorized surgery, 
you are depriving us of our ability to manage the claim, which the cases in Alabama throughout decades have invested in the employer, the TPA and the insurance company. Okay, we have that ability. We, the, by, the employee then changes the entire medical landscape by getting surgery that wouldn't authorize. So the question is, well, if, if, the other, if the ATP didn't say it was authorized, now you've had surgery, how does that, does that then relieve us of any liability for future medical treatment? It probably should because the entire landscape is, is changed. How do you know what disability is related to the original injury and accident and what's related to surgery done by somebody else we had no control over? Does it also impact our, our obligation to pay compensation? I think that it probably does. How can you determine whether or not somebody's permanent partial, permanent total when you have unauthorized treatment that changes things in a permanent way, Fred? Yes, to all that. All right, now, let me, I'm moving on. Number two, after we find out if there's an accident, here's the next point I wanna to get to. What is the injury? All right, here's a shocker for some of you out there. This is not health insurance. We don't cover everything. We gotta figure out what the injury is. Okay, they got hurt on the job. All right, Fred, we figured that out. Now let's see, what's the injury? Now they're gonna come in there and they're gonna say it's a low back, it's the upper back, it's the hip, it's a leg and the foot. It is very important to establish at the beginning, what is the injury? And I'll tell you what's even more important, and I'm getting ahead of myself, and Clay and I have talked about this before, settlement documents define the injury going forward, by the way. So you better make real sure if you leave medical benefits open that you define the injury, get with the lawyer, make sure you know it in advance. But we got to make sure. And somebody asked me, we, somebody asked me a question about uh, case nurse workers out here. And one of the things I was saying is, you know, there is, you got to be careful. Because as, as, as y'all know, the case nurse workers are independent and they have a fiduciary obligations under Alabama law to the patients. But there's nothing wrong with us saying to the case nurse worker, our injury is the elbow. Just make sure that when you get there, the doctor understands what our injury is. Now, if they want to go further with that and try to make something, that's fine. But we don't want to suddenly start treating everything in the world for what the injury might be. So my thought is, let's limit this thing to only things that are related. And I'll tell you another weird, weird thing too. If you, we're now seeing occupational disease, just to talk a second about COVID, all right? What about germ cases? Is it really, is the condition they have, are you treating something that is actually the injury? You know, we had one several years ago, we had a person who had tuberculosis, the injured plaintiff. And they said, I caught it at the hospital. Well. We sent an interrogatory. We said, who'd you catch it from? And they said, I caught it from Miss C, who was in room 212. Well, we got Miss C's medical records and we found out she didn't even have tuberculosis. Summary judgment. See, what is the injury? Does the injury have anything to do with something at work? So make sure you have an OD event and then make sure you figure out what is the injury. Don't treat everything over their whole body, Clay. I'm a big, big fan of the use of on-site nurse case managers, okay? I mean, it's, you can't use them in every case. I'd like to use surveillance in every case. It doesn't make sense because it doesn't make sense from a cost standpoint, okay? But in the case where there is a chance for you to lose control of the medical and for it to morph into something that we don't owe, you need to be using a nurse case manager. When you have sort of a, a claimant that has a problem providing a, a history, an accurate history to the doctor, you may need a nurse case manager. If you've got a, an approved treating physician that is not necessarily focused on returning somebody to work, you may need a nurse case manager that can, that can help, that, help it along in those ways. If there is a fundamental medical causation issue, which we all a lot, see a lot in these cases, particularly when we're talking about joint replacements, a nurse case manager who's asking the right question to the doctor can help enormously. I mean, as an example, I mean, you know, we're seeing shoulder replacements, knee replacements, hip replacements, and so forth. So let's 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 talk about let's talk about a knee replacement, okay? What is the reason for a knee replacement? Okay, it's just one, really. Okay, it's not pain. It's secondarily, it is pain. It's 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 arthritis. Okay. It is profound arthritic changes in the joint that require a joint replacement by the doctor, okay? They're, they can be very, they can be very successful surgeries. They're also very expensive. And the problem is, is that we don't always owe them. 
So if somebody had an on-the-job accident with a municipal tear and we fixed it, do we owe the total knee because they continue to have pain when they are 64, comorbid, overweight? The question then is, is the knee replacement that's, being, that's recommended by the doctor may be perfectly appropriate. Is it related to the accident that caused a meniscal tear or is it, as, is it to address the arthritis? And a nurse case manager, if, if the nurse case manager can get the doctor to focus on that question, can, that can be a $100,000 difference, okay? In the medical aspect of the case alone. You know, but you keep in mind that the doctors are trying to treat the patients. They're, they, you know, they're not necessarily focused on who owes it necessarily. This patient needs a total knee replacement. Well, the question is, from our standpoint, do we owe it or do we not owe it? Fred? All right, my third point. All right, we're moving out. Oh, wait, you're going to have to make question. it quick. Somebody we're on question? live TV. Well, and, and sometimes you're gonna lose that battle. You just are. So you, sometimes you are, but I mean, but, but you're gonna lose it a lot more times if there's no one in the room except the claimant and the doctor. I mean, that's, that's the point. I mean, it's, and, and that's true. And from a disability standpoint, I mean, if you've got somebody that could work before and now can't work by virtue of, let's say that's an injury to the back as an example, you may have a PT case. It just is what it is. But, you know, we ought to at least give an opportunity for, for the doctor to address that issue, because if it, if, it, if it goes the way we hope, then it's a big difference in the claim. Okay, you're right. Yes. We will next oh, time. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I yeah. don't even remember what it was, but. Well, basically what she was asking was, is, is that, you know, what if the doctor's position is, is that they couldn't, they could work before and now they can't work and they're relating it. And the, the answer is sometimes that, that's a battle you've lost, probably. Okay, I mean, there may be some ways to, to take another run of the doctor, but that's probably a battle that is lost, but we're not always gonna lose the battle, but we're gonna lose it a lot if we don't have a nurse case manager in the room. Okay, moving on with that. All right, you figured out something happened don't work. Now you figured out what the injury is. Again, I'm gonna keep this really simple today. Then we figure out what do we owe? Very simply in workers' comp, there's only three basic benefits. Vocational retraining, we hardly ever owe that. You can almost forget about it. Compensation and medical benefits. That's it, okay? We don't owe pain and suffering, but we owe compensation and medical benefits generally. Now, medical benefits, following up on all this. Uh, and by the way, I know a doctor who says total knee replacement is never knee, is never related to an acute event at work, by the way, on a side note on your question. But... Uh, <laughs> And, and he's good too. Uh, let me say this on medical benefits. Here's, yeah, everybody, <laughs> I got, see me afterwards. It, it charges $25 for each time I tell it. You know. <laughs> All right, here's the deal on medical benefits. Let me make a couple of quick points. Number one, you only have two basic medical benefits in Alabama, and this is it. You gotta make one authorized treating physician. The reason you get stuck if that authorized treating physician throws you under the bus is because the judges know you got to hand pick the doctor, okay? So you make sure that your people know which doctor to go to. And I'm not talking about sending them to a witch doctor. I'm talking about sending them to a doctor who has the fortitude mentally, and I hope they do, to say if something is work-related or not. I've got the guy that says total knee replacements are never related to work. If he tells me something is related to work, I believe him because I know he has the guts to say it's not related when it's not related. So you got to provide an authorized treating doctor. If they don't like them, you don't give them another doctor. You send them for a second opinion panel and you get a second shot. You get to name four they pick from. After that, I've had judges say nothing else is owed. If the panel doctor discharges them, it's over. So that's a, that law is a little open in Alabama, but that's your basic medical things. Now, here's the cutting edge stuff and where I'm seeing the mistake, and I'll get Clay to comment on this too. What is, we only owe reasonable medical care. 
We do not owe in work comp in Alabama perfect medical care, reasonable medical care. I'll give you two cases we handle. I'll give you an example. Guy calls, uh, adjuster calls me and says, Fred, they want, the guy wants a walk-in bathtub, $18,000. I said, we will lose at the trial court. We'll have to go all the way to the Court of Civil Appeals, but uh, you have a good shot at winning, but it'll cost, I said, it'll cost you more than $18,000. This is gonna be a big deal. And company calls back and says, we'll pay it. We all need to know. Court of Civil Appeals issued a decision. They say this. They say, it is unreasonable for you to have to pay for an $18,000 walk-in tub if we can get this person into the tub with a transfer bench for $200. It was unreasonable. Another one both unreasonable and unrelated. We have a person who the settlement paperwork says it's the L2 is the level of the injury. They come back and now they want surgery at L5. We deny it. Of course, they sue for everything they can think of. The Court of Civil Appeals reverses a trial court judge and says not owed. It's a different body part than the original settlement paperwork. That's not reasonable to make us pay for the whole body. So ask yourself, is it reasonable? And finally, the other one, and, and is, is the, the, the little fella I had that it was getting two pills from the pain doctor a month uh, or two pills a day, and it was costing us $50 a month. The doctor comes in and prescribes one pill that combines two, and he says it's easier on him because he doesn't understand English to only have to take one instead of two, although I'd been taking it for six years. It was like a thousand a month for the new pill. Unreasonable. We took the doctor's deposition and get this. He said, I didn't even know what it cost. Some sales rep came in and said it was a great idea. He said, yeah, we'll go back to the other. Let's go back to five bucks a day or whatever it is. So you see reasonability. You don't owe everything in the world. Clay. Well, one of the, and this is, it's interesting because one of the things we're seeing from time to time are compounds, okay? Where they're taking in, 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 inert ingredients that cost virtually nothing and they're putting them together and charging you $2,500 a month. I mean, that's, you know, so the question is, is that, well, let's start with this not approved by the FDA, but, um, but there's a question of whether or not that's reasonable medical care. And that, and, and, you know, if, if you can't make a, if you can't convince the, the, the ATP of that, then sometimes you need to file a motion, let the court decide that. Okay. Now panels, one time panel from a claims management standpoint, it makes sense to get the injured worker to spend that panel as soon as they can. Okay. Because if you give them one doctor after another doctor, you can give them 500 doctors. And if they haven't asked for a, if they haven't asked for a panel, you've not given one, they, get, they still get a panel after 500 doctors, okay? Now, we need to be honest and legitimate about it because if they, are, if they have to be dissatisfied, the statute says, with their treating physician, okay? But if, if you've got them on the phone and they say, I don't like where my treatment is going, or I don't like this doctor, or I don't like the result of the, whatever it is, you are perfectly entitled to say, would you like a panel of four physicians? Yes, I would. And you give them a panel of four. Now, where do you get the panel? Okay. I've got a list, but, but, and, and you can call me if you want to. And, and my list has got people on there that are great doctors, some of whom are dead. They're still great doctors. <laughs> Dr. Kevorkian, right here at the top. Um, Yes. How successful are missions before the court for compound RX? Say that again. How successful are missions before the court for compound RX? Well, here I'm giving you a perfectly legitimate and real lawyer response that you don't want to hear. It depends. <laughs> it depends on whether where you are. Okay, it depends on who the judge is. It depends on the facts of the case. It depends on whether or not there's been a lot of distractive, distracting garbage that's gone on in the case beforehand that has caused us to lose credibility with the court. Okay, which is another lesson. We, we need to maintain our, we need to manage our cases to the extent that we possibly can, because if we have to go to trial, we want to go to the trial and the reasons we want to go to trial, which is usually, do we owe this or do we not? But, it, it does depend, the, and, and, and they've gone both ways, okay? I will say that judges, and keep in mind that Alabama has partisan election of judges, but, but, but we handle workers' compensation in the court system, the, the traditional civil court system. 
Those judges are also seeing divorce cases and they're seeing criminal cases oftentimes, and they're seeing the destructive effect of drugs, particularly pharmaceuticals, okay, that have on families and so forth. Um, and what are you looking at? She's no, watching not. me take my coat off. Okay. <laughs> what Question. are you doing? <laughs> anyway, filing a motion under those circumstances would be very, very helpful. And, and we have won. Fred's had these cases. Okay, there are other lawyers have had these cases. They're winners. They're winners when you want to get like an IME to take another look at what's going on there. They just are winners. But you want to have your nurse case manager put together your panel for you, generally speaking, okay? Because you want the nurse case manager to coordinate and, uh, and attend the treatment. You want the nurse case manager to put on that panel, not only good doctors, but doctors that the nurse case manager knows, because what you're really leveraging in that situation is a relationship. Back to human behavior, right? Fred? Yeah. We, now, we have on. another question, and it's about panels. About animals? Panels. About animals. About animals. If it's on the screen behind you, if you want to read it, how many panels are too many? Two. Okay. I have a claimant that has provided nine panels, and every doctor has declined to see them. Okay, I've been down that road. Let me just tell you, that's a bad road to go down. You need better doctors, obviously. But I have been down that road and the Court of Civil Appeals has told me to go back and keep getting more doctors, okay? That's not fun, but that is just real sometimes. You gotta find four doctors who will take treatment. Your nurses, as Clay said, are a big help with that. Now, all right, I'm gonna move on. I'm, I'm still on well, my let track. Me, let me, let me right, ask some, some, you know, I'm going the, my track. The, the, problem, the problem with that situation is this, is that, and I think it's a legitimate question. Where does our legal obligation end, okay? I mean, because where are we seeing, you know, a lot of times we're seeing these, these requests for multiple panels as a result of a misbehaving claimant, okay? Where, they, where they, they, they're acting out or they're doing things that the doctor didn't want them to do, taking things they're not supposed to be taking and so forth, and they get fired, okay? And they may get fired more than once. And so when you're trying to shop a new doctor or a panel, it's difficult. And, you know, it's, and the law is not on our side always on this issue, but it's a tough one. But I think that there's got to be a line somewhere. And there's, there's some judges and plaintiff lawyers will say, there's no limit. And when you exhaust all the doctors in Alabama, you can go to neighboring states. They'll tell you that. I don't think it goes that far. Fred? No, I don't either. But I'm telling you, it's very, very situational on that question. All right, I'm going to move from medicals to compensation. Then here's where I want to give everybody some bad news, but real news about how to calculate what your claim exposure is in Alabama. There's a, all right, now, first of all, by the way, don't, calculating what is owed in Alabama is no game of monopoly. It is a little complicated. When I was in law school, we took the workers' comp class. There were 38 future lawyers in the class. We had a problem one day, and they said, what would this person be owed? We had 38 different answers. That's how messed up it could get. There are reported cases where judges have screwed up calculations. So be careful with this stuff. But let me tell you, there's a footnote on page 13. If you have a copy of my handout, you'll see a footnote on page 13. Some of y'all calculate and you call me and you say, what's the 3% rating? We owe 3%. That is great if they say yes. But get this, look at footnote 13. We've had people with a 3% rating and they get a 50% award from the trial judge. We've had people with a 4% rating. They get an 88% award. I mean, it just multiplies and multiplies. So when you're evaluating how much compensation is owed, it's not gonna always be, it's $3,225. That's in your view of the world. There was a person sued because they wrote a letter and said, under Alabama law, your case is worth $3,425. Well, that was not necessarily true. Your case is worth what the judge says it is. So what we generally recommend you say is something like, in our view, we believe this case would be worth $3,500, whatever it is. That's our view, okay? Because otherwise, what happened, one of the best plaintiff lawyers in the state sued the adjuster for fraud. They set aside a settlement, get sued for punitive damages because they started telling a claimant exactly what the calculation is. So the moral of that story is, that is something you got to look at in every case. Now, what's it worth? All right, I'm going to throw out two things. I'll do the number one and number two factor on what every case is worth. Number one, the credibility of the plaintiff. 
We got, that's why somebody said, why do you, we need to take everybody's deposition? So we find out if they have any credibility. You know, we're trying to win. Okay. And then the second thing you got to figure out is who was the trial court judge. All right. Here, we had two judges in Northwest Alabama. Uh, I can't even, Judge Hatterholt was one of them. He's passed away now. And the other guy, one of them would always get permanent totals. The other one wouldn't give anybody any disability, but they change cases every 12 months. And so if you were on the defense and you were with the one that was the plaintiff oriented and you got set for trial in December, you'd come down with a heart attack to keep from going to trial so you could push it into January and get the other judge. Now that makes no sense, but no matter how much money we all spend on all this stuff, it's going to come down to eventually Clay or I, or ever your defense lawyer is, one of us is going to be in a room with the judge and he's going to go, Fred, why hasn't this settled? And I better have a good reason if we're up there and not something foolish. But we have to recognize if it's a 25 year employee who has no history of prior claims and it's a swearing match, that 25 year employee is going to get deferential over the guy that got hurt the first day on the job. And if it's a judge of a certain ilk or another ilk, that's going to make a difference no matter what the facts are. You just tell me, oh, we should win this. Well, we should, but we're not going to, you know, because I know this judge. And that's how you got to, this is like hiring people in Afghanistan to work for us. You know, we got to, we got to have people on the ground that know what the enemy looks like. And that's what the lawyer should bring to you. Not the case nurse on that. On the judges, we should bring that to you. Clay. Assessment and strategy of these cases is subjective. It just is in Alabama. It, it just is. It's a judgment call. And so, I mean, you know, that's why Fred and I spend countless time with clients explaining why, even though they got a 10% rating to the arm, you need to pay 20 or 25 sometimes. I mean, it's it, it because it's not up to the, it's not up to, it's not up to the doctor to decide what the case is worth as it is in some states. Now Alabama is up to the judge, period. And the judge almost always applies a multiplier uh, uh, for, an, for an impairment rating, particularly to a scheduled injury. That's just what they do. So, you know, we just need to keep that in mind. Now, it's a good reference point when you're talking to somebody about settling the case. It's a good beginning point for settlement. It's a rational place to begin, but it doesn't, it, this, that is not what the case is worth necessarily. You know, the, the problem we've got in Alabama in terms of subjective issues and trying to get cases settled, your permanent total cases, you know, you, your lawyers will probably say, told you, you know, this is a gray area settlement. OK, what that really means is, is that in, in view of the statutory cap of $220 a week, OK, you've got you've got the max out that has been dropping over the years. OK, so you if you, you let's say you have a bricklayer is an example I like to use who has compensable injury, has a successful, reasonably successful back surgery is released to medium duty, okay? Pretty good, I can work with that. Is that a permanent partial case? If you're a bricklayer with a sixth grade education or is that a permanent total case? Okay, that's the question, that's the question. And I'm here to tell you that in a lot of judges, when they're talking candidly in their chambers, they're saying, that's a permanent total case. I'd rather give too much than too little, okay? What the cap has done is has eliminated good choices for judges to make. They can't decide somebody is 75%, although that might be perfectly appropriate, okay? So when we go to mediation, you know, we have got, and that case is an example, that case may be, depending where you are, maybe have a settlement value of 85. Somewhere else, it may have a settlement value of 130 with meds open, depending, Fred. Yeah, and it absolutely depends on who the judge is. Let me throw you another calculation curve as we're thinking about the value of these cases, the return to work statute. Y'all call me up and you say, Fred, they've got an 8% rating and they're back at work, so we shouldn't pay more than 8%. Wrong. Case law says you can, the judges can award more than eight based on the subjective testimony, as long as it's physical impairment and not vocational impairment. They say, Fred, we won't settle. Make them waive the reopening statute. Can't do it. It's just like medicals. And if we go to trial, we can't do it. We try the case and, we, and you want us to say, keep them to the physical impairment rating. Don't get them get a voc report. Well, if we're doing that, we're inherently saying generally that it's because they're back at work. And if they're back at work, the judge will automatically leave the reopening statute open and then they get to reopen their case for 300 weeks. So there's a lot of little nuances on this stuff. All right, but I'm going to change topics, move on to the next topic, settlements. 
if you settle, remember we said something earlier, if you settle, make most of all, make sure if you leave meds open, you describe the injury. What the courts are saying now, I, I was actually one of the Court of Civil Appeals judges was telling me the way they're looking at it is they look at the settlement paperwork and the settlement paperwork that was agreed to by you and your lawyer becomes the facts. Doesn't matter what the facts were. The facts are now the settlement paperwork. So if the settlement paperwork says this is a C1 injury, it's a C1 injury. If it says it's an ear injury, it's an ear injury. So you got to make sure you get that right. But you need to make sure, most of all, that it matches your file. So what we've started doing, and what I think the best practice right now is, and this did not used to be the way out lawyers did in Alabama. 20 years ago, we'd say they hurt their back. And the problem is now we're 20 years later and they're still getting treated and all of a sudden it's a runaway back. You know what I'm talking about. So now we want to narrow it down, define the paperwork and make sure the lawyer's description of the injury matches your description of the injury or somebody's going to be opening everybody's mind up and pulling brains out soon. Clay? I agree. I agree. It's um, all right. Don't have your lawyers take doctor's depositions. It's a waste of time. Okay, there are some exceptions. There's some exceptions. If you have a great report that says full duty, okay, what is it that you're hoping to gain in a doctor's deposition? Particularly since records come in evidence. How does it get better than full duty, no impairment? It doesn't get better than that. You can't get better than that. But if you go to a deposition, what's going to happen if you have a decent lawyer on the other side? My lady is testifying under oath that she can't lift over 25 pounds and doing so causes her a lot of pain. Would you agree that she ought to avoid activities that require her to lift over 25 pounds? What is the doctor gonna say? Every time, every time. This, this is not a paint by numbers game anymore. This is a nuanced, complicated, process that we're engaging in to defend these cases. Now, if you have a last and jurist exposure rule situation, maybe, maybe time to take a doctor's deposition, okay? If you, if you are trying to put off the injury on a subsequent employer and there's been another, and there's been another accident event or an aggravation, you don't have to prove much. You just have to prove slightly that is permanent. And you can walk away from that. Now, that's a situation you may want to take a doctor's deposition. Fred, what do you think? Yeah, and you, you might, you might. I, I would say this, you can't get any better than no impairment, no restriction. So don't take their deposition. Because what happens is the other lawyer, the plaintiff lawyers, even the bad ones will go, well, isn't it possible that he actually cannot do the work? And the doctors will go, well, I guess it's possible. And then we have to go, isn't it possible they're a fraud? Well, I guess that's possible too. I mean, it just goes back and forth, but then the judge ends up with a factual dispute, which you've created. Then if we go to trial and you have a judge of the plaintiff ilk and you have a credible plaintiff, all of a sudden you get blasted and you wonder what happened. Now, let me talk about after the settlement. Here's the latest phenomena that's been going on now for about five years, and that's you're all getting sued after the settlement when you deny medical treatment and you sit there and we have the only two big reported outrage cases in Alabama where adjusters denied hot tubs, okay? So when I did that one where I told you about with a walk-in tub, we filed, we instead of just denying it, we filed what is commonly now called the post-judgment motion. Instead of the adjuster taking a chance on getting sued for outrage and they're being held in contempt, what we try to do instead is we go judge, we don't think we owe the walk-in tub, but we need you to tell us. And we had an interesting case, went all the way to the Court of Civil Appeals after I got slammed, I they said, pay for the surgery and won. And they said, pay the guy his attorney's fee of $8,000. And what happened, we appealed it, Court of Civil Appeals took it away completely from them. And the Court of Civil Appeals said, because we filed the motion first, rather than just denying it, we could not be held in contempt. Then on top of that, they went further and said, we don't, didn't even owe the surgery. OK, so they got zeroed out. But I knew the local judge and I knew the Court of Civil Appeals. So you can see it's going to have to play out. So all these things, all these things are these variables. And that's why lawyers do always say it all depends, because it does. You know, this is not black and white stuff. This is really murky. OK, and, you know, it can go all over the place. Clay? On a compensable claim, you end medical treatment at your peril. Okay, you ended at your peril. 
There are except this doesn't mean that we're being we're deprived of our ability to manage a claim. I'm not saying that, okay? But if you are you know, on a compensable back claim, denying treatment because you think it's not necessary, that's that's a recipe for a problem, either for outrage or if there's a court order for leaving medical benefits open for contempt, okay? And that's that's you can the case can go south in a heartbeat under those circumstances. Now, you know, if somebody is involved in a catastrophic motor vehicle accident, then you're certainly clear, and the and the evidence is clear. Then you can, I think, you can make good judgments based on that. But if there's a question about medical treatment in an ex, a previously accepted claim, the 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 safest and most pragmatic way to go is to file a motion with the court. Okay, and sometimes you know we as claim professionals, you know, it's it's like oh, God, we don't want to go get back in litigation. It's not really getting back in a big way. Okay, I know we have to have explain this to to the insurers, to the client, to the employer, whatever. But you're talking about a motion from a from a pure cost standpoint that's not very expensive. Okay, two or three hours to prepare the motion, maybe the same amount to attend, prepare and attend the hearing. And you can have the matter addressed, okay? And you lose, or you don't lose, and then you can decide what to do from there. Fred? Yeah, and let me say one other thing on these post judgment motions. This is real. Just this week, and sometimes I do a little bit of mediator work. Uh, seems like the more gray hairs you get, the more they ask you to do that. And when I'm mediating, uh, you know, you hear different sides, and it's kind of fun to do. I kind of enjoy to hear what everybody's saying. But I've got one just this past week the adjuster or the insurance company, I'm going to mediate this case. I don't know all the facts, but I can tell you what I can tell from the court file. They cut out some future treatment and they have been sued for contempt of court for not following the order that left medical benefits open. And uh, Judge Claude Hundley and Hustle has appointed me to resolve the case and to make matters more confusing. When I called the, part, the, the, the parties the, the insured who's being held in contempt, who'd be your company, doesn't even know the process is pending. Now, the moral of all that story is not only do you need to settle and not only do you need to make sure you get these things right, but you need to communicate with the insured, the people that paid for these premiums and let them know what's going on. And the thing I also wonder about those cases is if the adjuster is the one who's got them sued, it seems to me that if there's gonna be a payment on that, it ought to come from the insurance company and not from the employer because they don't have anything to do with these claims. Y'all are calling the shots. So if you call the shots and it's like I said, and you're willing to cut somebody off a medical bill and it'll be something, it won't be something clear. It'll be like those hot tubs, to, you know, 10, 20 years ago, those two hot tubs where the, I'm sure back in the, in the adjuster's office, they're like, we're not paying for a hot tub. Well, after I think it Clay, as I recall, it was seven figure awards of outrage against it was the seven, It was seven hundred fifty dollars in Houston County. Seven hundred fifty thousand in nineteen ninety, when seven hundred fifty thousand was real money. And you know, the funny thing is that is that um, the claim handler that handled that case, I know, I know, she's retired now, but and she she told me the story, and it's it's one of the, it's the typical thing, okay, where the case has been around a long time. It had been shipped from one claim professional to another over a period of time. Um, you know, the doctor's office was mad at the at the at the insurance company, and you know, and you know, they every time it got transferred, there was a new request for medical records, even though they've been supplied X number of period, you know, X number of times, all that kind of stuff. And so there was a, there was a lot of communication, a lot of animus, a lot of heat already there, and so the doctor then prescribes a jacuzzi, okay, as part of the medical treatment. New claims handler, I'm not paying for that. Denied. Outrage case. I mean, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. That's what happens. I mean, it's, you know, it's, we're not seeing as many uh, outrage cases as we used to, you know, because we're able to keep track of files and, you know, we don't have hard files that people have to handle anymore. Everything's pretty electronic and we have things in front of us pretty easily. So we can look easily and see what the claim history is. We all vulnerable to contempt actions. Okay, that is, that's the new revenue stream for plaintiff lawyers that are looking for that additional hit in cases. Um, we see that, we see that, we see that a lot. And that's also another reason that if you are going to leave medical benefits open, that those settlements need to go through an ombudsman and not be court approved, at least initially. Okay, that doesn't make your, that mean you're immune for a contempt action at some later time, but it's, you're going to get a shot across the bow because there's nothing pending before the court. Fred? Yeah, and just think about that. 
you get held in contempt for disobeying a court order, not an ombudsman order. Okay, so that's when we're closing meds now, we're all, like Clay said, we're all moving toward doing the BRC route. And I would suggest you consider that, especially for closing meds, unless as an exception to that, we get Medicare issues going on and a lot of things where we need some kind of, we need some statements from a judge that he's reviewed it and he agrees nothing else is owed and he agrees it's totally disputed and we got to weigh all those benefits. Now, let me throw another assessment out on here. As we're assessing these things and wrapping them up, one of the things you need to decide and you need to communicate effectively to lawyers, what is your philosophy on litigation? Because I have got wonderful companies who absolutely would prefer to pay more upfront and not keep something going for a year or two. Then I've got other wonderful companies who are like, we're not paying a dime we're just going to make them earn it and make them go to trial. Now, neither one of those positions is wrong. But one of the things we have to figure out from you is, what are you? Do you really want to do this? Because if you call them and say, just turn down the settlement, just go forward. Well, that's fine. But in two years, don't be telling me, oh, my gosh, how did we get a legal fee? Well, because we could have settled for this price two years ago. So why not settle it now? I've got, uh, I had one, we had one going on where it was all about a back surgery, totally disputed. And I'm clay seeing the same thing. If we lose the case, we owe a $75,000 procedure, plus it'll probably become a permanent total. So the company says, fire all guns. I don't care what it costs, defend it, fight it off. We don't believe it. Turned out this guy wasn't very credible. We had like his Facebook picture, you know, holding his guns, which I'm a Second Amendment guy. I didn't have a problem with that, but it looked, it looked pretty something. But we, we had that for the judge. And then he changed his Facebook page to a picture of him shooting a bird at us. Okay. Judge didn't like that either. So we ended up getting a zero, but we were getting ready to try that case. And when we were getting ready to try the case, the, the guy was with me who had said, push it all the way. We had taken three or four doctor's depositions. People, witnesses were flown in everything. And the fee was pretty dang big. But I remember turning to the associate who was working with me. And I said, let me just tell you something. If we lose this case, we will never represent them again. Because I know he said he'd rather pay us and pay the other side, but he didn't mean it, okay? <laughs> and thank the Lord, we're still representing them today because we zeroed them out. But you make sure, sit there up front and go, give me a realistic estimate. You know, we used to, and one more thing, we used to say when we started off, uh, comp, the budget, litigation budget, $3,000. You know what, I, put it, I just say twenty five dollars now. Because if we actually have to go all the way through a trial, by the time we get ready for it, write briefs, potential doctor depositions, you're gonna spend that much money, so why not get rid of the case now? They never get better till you settle. They're just gonna get worse. They're gonna develop more problems. They're gonna get hurt again. They'll overuse the right hip and then the left hip won't work and then the legs don't work. And then they're totally disabled over a scratch, you know? <laughs> and that's how they, they get worse, Clay. You know, in this, in this age of metrics, which are all we are all subject to, lawyers are, you are, it's how we're evaluated, isn't it? I mean, I mean, it's, we, we are. You've got to be right about your opinions, okay? I mean, the, in the old days, you know, the defense lawyers used to, you know, they evaluate a case, they put, I'm gonna put a little gravy in there, give me a little maneuvering room. That is just, that's just not correct. It's not, it's not the right way to do it. You ask me how much I think that it's gonna settle this, it's gonna take to settle this case, I'm gonna tell you, and expect to spend all of it. Now, we're gonna save as much as we can, but this is what I think it's gonna take. You know, it's, and sometimes, you know, sometimes we're, we're confronted with situations where, you know, we have used strategies in the last year or so in a couple of cases, it's rare, that I never thought we would use, okay? So are there situations where you would stipulate to PT? Well, the answer to that question is yes, there are, okay? This is understanding human behavior again. So what, and I've got this case now. So. You've got a case where you're currently paying TTD. They're about to get the MMI. You've been paying a long time, okay? They're represented by counsel. This person, even though they're not an MMI yet and will be soon, no question is PT, okay? So what do you do? You try to settle. And the lawyer, by the way, says, not taking a dime, not ever, not never, ever, never, less than 450. You mediate that case and say, you got a choice. We'll pay 150 or we'll stipulate to PT. And by the way, you get 90,000, Mr. Lawyer, and your client, they don't get anything except 15% less than they were. That creates an interesting dynamic. 
Don't you think? Fred, what do you think about that? Yeah, and, and, and let, let me start again, a corollaries to the corollaries. We had this situation. We get these all the time. If, if you're looking at these things since the beginning, a lot of times y'all pay a claim that you may not owe. And then you're 75,000 into it and you're thinking, I'm not even sure we owe this claim. So there is a right time to deny a claim at the beginning rather than just give up and say, we're gonna wave the white flag with the chicken on it and pay everything that you asked for, all right? So we wanna evaluate those kind of assessments. I'll give you the cla two classic examples. I had a guy, we tried a case in, in, in Huntsville where a guy said his knee was hurt. Uh, he had already been paid about $50,000 in medical combined in compensation benefits. Nobody, the, and this is why you almost have to be on the ground to figure this out because the adjuster couldn't do this. They're in another town far away. Nobody ever talked to the co-employees. We talked to the co-employees and find out what happened. They said he came in that day and his was hobbling and his knee was already hurt. And the judge said, I agree. And he zeroed him out. And the judge looks over at me and he says, do y'all want the money back? Now, let me tell you, if I say yes, we lose because an educated adjuster paid those claims. And there's some case on that now that it actually supports that too. But if I say no, we don't want the money back. We want to stop the bleeding and the judge zeroes him out. All right. Now, another one, that guy with a head injury, they've already paid like $80,000 on this one. He says he got knocked out at work. He got hit in the head. Okay. Well, the interesting thing was they paid the claim, everything. He went, to the, he went to the Huntsville Hospital with a head injury, he said. Yeah, and he said, he said, he says, I got, I got my head hurt. And, you know, it's one of these closed head things. Well, come to find out, his head wasn't hurt bad enough for him to get on his cell phone the whole time at the hospital and start talking to people. And then he goes in there and says, my head hurts. But they didn't know that. So they paid the claim. Tried the case. Claude Hundley, Huntsville, the same judge that assigned me on the mediation last week. What does Claude Hundley say? Zero. That guy gets a zero. But they had already paid all that money and we can't get it back. So what I'm, I'm, I used to say, try to get rid of things, but I'm leaning now toward, if you don't think you owe it, before you spend $100,000, take a close look and say, should we maybe even file suit and ask the judge to determine, you know, play with the jumpsuit. You do that all Good the time. Good example of, yes. Good example of understanding human behavior. You know, this is, this is a nuanced business. You know, the, the <sighs> judges, don't like, most of all, having their time wasted, okay? So they don't necessarily want to try cases, which is why they ask us, why in the world hasn't this case settled, okay? Which is why we, when we, when we have needless disputes that really don't matter in the whole scheme of things, we don't need to be trotting to the courthouse and arguing about stuff, okay? About whether or not, you know, you know, a dispute on mileage is $35. We don't need to argue about that stuff. We don't need to, we don't need to file needless motions. Even plaintiff lawyers, you know, they don't, they don't mind, they understand, okay? They understand that you've got an adverse position, okay? What they don't understand and don't like is a needless and pointless dispute over something that shouldn't be a dispute and the judges don't like it either. Let me tell you something else the judges don't like. They don't like peer review and they don't like the CDG. They don't like them. Now, there are tools that we can use and we still continue to use them, but we are not going to win a motion based on a peer review most of the time. Fred, what do you think about that? Yeah, and I'll tell you, I'm thinking about things judges don't like. We got about three minutes. All right, I'll tell you another thing they don't like when they campaign. Oh, I want to be a judge. I want to hear all the cases. I want to make all the rulings. Okay, once they get on the bench, they don't want to try a case. They don't want to do any work. They want to get off on Tuesday and be out the rest of the week. And so if you're sending that lawyer in there to fight about something, you better make sure that the lawyer agrees with you that we're not going to do nothing more in this case than irritate the judge. And one of the things I've always liked about the court approved settlement, by the way, which I still like is, particularly if we have a big name in a county, let's say, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, I represent the Madison County Commission on their comp work, okay? This is all public. I'm not speaking out of school. Well, okay, on all their, well, they want all their settlements court approved. Why? Because all their suits are in the same courthouse over and over and over, and they want the judges to know that they take care of people. And so we approve all their settlements, and they have a great name with judges. And then if we go up there and we're fighting one, the judges go, huh, this, they must be something to this. I mean, I feel like they, human behavior, the judge is thinking, 
Well, they usually pay claims they think are valid. They're not a bunch of jerks. So maybe this one isn't owed, you know? So think about your reputation, your lawyer's reputation, and what the judge thinks of everything. Clay? Henry, how much time we have? About one minute. Right. One minute. Take it. Okay. Let's talk about IMEs just for a second. Okay. I Yes. Question come through online, and they said it a few minutes ago, but we were trying to find a break in. Is there a mileage or driving time limit that's deemed reasonable? A, a time limit? A driving or mileage limit that's deemed reasonable for treatment. It it's got to be reasonable, okay? They can't drive, they can't leave Florence, Alabama and drive to Mobile to go to the pharmacy. And, and Clay and I had a case in the Court of Civil Appeals where they actually said, you could, they get to pick their pharmacy in Alabama if they want to, by the way. But it said if they do pick their own pharmacy, they can't like pick a pharmacy in Houston and charge you for mileage. So it's going to be what's reasonable. And I know everybody hates that answer, but that is the real world. We got to look at this. And it's like the guy said to me, the, with our criminal law professor, which I didn't care for the criminal law, but I like the guy. He said, every case you pick up, we got this and we got this and we got this and we got this. And nobody knows, you know. And he was right. Nobody knows. So why are we here? <laughs> <laughs> I can't Thank you. That's Thanks, it. everybody. Thanks.